OK, great. So let's start with the second talk for today. I hope everyone's settled in. I promise there won't be as much math as before, but hopefully there's still some takeaways for you guys to make use of. So my name is Ramanan Balakrishnan. I work at this company called Semantics 3. If you guys have not heard about it, I'll probably talk to you later. But today it's going to be a talk about classification in general. So for those of you who get the reference, a study in classification, <coughs> yeah, it's related to something else. So before I jump in, here's a small blurb. So the company I work at, it's a small startup here. It's called Semantics 3. We help with e-commerce businesses all over the world. And we do a number of data or AI solutions for them. So, and some of the common tasks, which most of you are also familiar with probably, is like classification and also <coughs> entity recognition. So if there's a lot of NLP going on, you probably want to extract it out. We also have certain expertise in like unsupervised extraction, product matching, search, and of course, wide, large-scale distributed crawling. So all of these things sort of fit together. And today, I'm going to be talking about the first part over there, which is classification in general and how you go about approaching some of these problems. Because some of the times, it seems like a simple enough problem, but only with like certain effort, you start seeing what are the complications that it involves. So with that out of the way, let's get started. I'm quite sure we have a lot of fans in the house here. Looks like the party just ended, a lot of upsets, a lot of surprise victories. But uh, let's see, I'm guessing all of you had your own favorite team you're rooting for. Hopefully they won, or maybe not. But let's uh, pick a team. And then we we'll want to monetize on our whole aspect, right? We want to like go ahead and let's say we want to sell jerseys for this team across the world. And then we want to like make money out of it. $19, $90, that seems a lot. But okay, so here the interesting part is that you make these jerseys and then they come with their own set of features. For this use case, it's mostly going to be the more abstract part. It says 51% polyester, 49% recycled polyester and double knit. This is probably going to be relevant later on in the talk. So the idea is that you go to China, where apparently everything is made these days, and then you decide you're going to end up buying a lot of these jerseys. And then you want to sell it across the world. You want to sell it in all the countries that take part, hopefully more countries. And one of them which didn't make the cut this year was the United States, but you decide you anyway want to go ahead and sell there. So what is the process? So how do you go about it? This is just to give you the domain idea, right? So you go, you say you have a t-shirt, and then you go to the customs officer, he gives you a book. So imagine like 6,000 pages. So that's like, this is like 500, and then there's like 10 more volumes of it. So you get this book, you start flipping through pages. You flip through page one, page two, page five, page 500, 6,000. And then at the end of the day, you want to find how you call this jersey. So it's a jersey, right? But how do you want to classify it? And to give a short story of how it looks, it's actually called a harmonized system code or a HS code. This is probably familiar for those who are in the logistics space, but the idea is that you want this sort of classification system to standardize global trade. And for this specific use case, it falls into, let's call something as a chapter 61, which is for apparel, knitted or crocheted. And the idea is that you shouldn't make a mistake right off the bat, where 62 is actually something very, very similar. Everything is the same, except like a few riders. And then this is, of course, very simple if it's only 61. But then you go further, you start saying it's for jerseys, pullovers, cardigans. And then you go even further. You say it's made of man-made fibers. So the idea of this whole task is to start with a specific product. And then the idea is, at the end of the day, you come up with a classification label. And this is going to impact a lot of things downstream. And that is what we want to focus on for this talk. It's not just about getting labels correct. It's about analyzing the impact also. So just to give you like the case for this HS codes, they are set up by the UN or the World Customs Organization within it. And they are signat the signatories are over 180 countries. They have agreements all over the world. So roughly it's trillions of dollars, I guess, of like global trade of goods. So it's a pretty important code to like think about. There's a lot riding on this. Or if you think about like a closer to home example, there are fans here and then there are the other extremes of people who like and don't like the GST. So, for example, you have this bottle of jam, right? It says Kisan jam. So is this, how do you classify this? Do you think about it as a preparation of a fruit? In which case, the government is going to ask you for 12%. Or do you end up thinking of it as something which just has sugar, which just has like confectionery, which you spread on like your cakes or something, your breads. So which has like 18% GSD. So these are going to impact, this is probably going to be like a 50% increase in the tax that you end up paying out. 
So these sort of classification systems are present all over the world. The idea is that the impact is going to be slightly different depending on the use case that you're talking about. So the first step, you heard Chris, write it down. So let's write it down how, right? Like we want to formulate a problem statement. Otherwise, it's not going to be of much use. And the very simplistic way of writing it down is just to say solve the HS code assignment problem. And then at this point, you're thinking it's just a classification task, right? You end up just classifying things. And then for that, I had this uh, cue ball over here from XKCD. So cue ball is thinking that, okay, I'm good at understanding numbers. So that's step one. And then you say the stock market is made of numbers. So then he comes up thinking that, okay, so therefore, and then boom, suddenly where did all my money go? So the idea is that you don't want to like preempt yourself by starting with such a simplistic problem statement, and you want to make sure that you have the right ideas in mind. So for that, we went back and we wanted to see what is the current state of the art. Like you want to do something which is replacing a process. Very likely it's been there for decades. And then so we went ahead, we went to our own companies that we work with, and this is for example, like they have this huge warehouse where they start shipping products in, and these are where the inventory is managed, products are tagged, prices are assigned, boxes are filled. And then they literally have people who open up the boxes, they scan the codes, they start seeing inside the boxes, they want to inspect it, they write it up. And then they look at books, they have these huge books, and then they start annotating processes. So if someone had considered so much of effort to do some things like this, the idea is to see that it's really worth replacing. So this process probably takes of the order of minutes. You're talking maybe three minutes, five minutes. And then if you're shipping multiple boxes, it's probably going to be a very time consuming task. So let's not oversimplify the people who are working at it. Let's try to come back and formulate like a better version of the problem statement, or at least formulate it in a simpler format, right? Or a more understanding format. So the idea is that life imitates art, or let's see if our systems can imitate the state of the art over here. So you have a input product. This is also very similar to the talk yesterday which Shailesh gave on stimulus and response. So if you think about stimulus and response as how your inputs and outputs are being set up, you probably have an input product, you pass it into a black box. We'll come back to that later. And then you get a output label. Now most cases, if you start with just simple data, it's probably going to be a barcode, a UPC code, and then it's not going to give you enough information about the product. If you end up only using things like this, you might say that one thick line translates to this code, whereas a thin line translates to some other code. That's just going to be rubbish data. So you're probably going to need slightly more complicated information. You probably need a much better set of features, whether it's the name, whether it's the description, whether it's something to do with how the product was made, the country of origin, things like that. And then, of course, you have the output label. Following the same example from a few slides back, you end up with 61, 10, 30, which in like real life speak, talks about those HS code labels. So the idea is that we want to build this classifier in the middle, this sort of black box, which people like to think of as, I just throw numbers or throw data in, and then hopefully it gives me the correct label. And for that, I usually like to use this picture over here, which is from SK Learn. We'll look at it in a bigger slide later, but the idea is that <clears throat> you want to use multiple models. So you want to use at different parts of the system, you want to consider different options. So for that, before we get started on that, but what do we do, right? We need to collect data. It's better to start monitoring first rather than like starting realizing that you need to collect data after you start modeling. So the first part of collection, like where do we start, where do we start the whole process? It's better to start at the beginning. Hopefully, you are able to get labeled data. That's probably where the crux of the problem is. Like whenever someone asks, how do I get started with any of these? The blocker is not in the model, so TensorFlow is probably open source, you have all these libraries, the cloud is free for you to use, but the idea is not free, but it's like open to everyone. But the idea is that the label data is going to be the problem, the blocker. So hopefully, for this use case, we can leverage on international shipping records. Most, com most countries need that to be publicly disclosed. Whenever you bring something in a container or out, it's probably available to the government. But the problem is that it's going to be really shitty. People are just going to say shoo, and then leave it at that. Also, there are third-party aggregators. These are things of just thinking about it. You probably have someone who's already monetizing these data. If you're giving it away for someone and then they probably collect it, store it together, and hopefully they can make much more sense of it. And then, of course, the worst case scenario, you sit down, you, write, you open your Excel sheet, and then you start writing records yourself. Hopefully it's not too expensive, but this is probably the highest ROI if you're especially starting a new project. Like if you're starting from scratch or if you're opening up a new project, 
collecting label data is probably the best use of your time, even though it's not glamorous, even though it's not the data science role that you were hoping to do. But the idea is that you start with data, and then from there you go to the modeling part. And hopefully, after like many weeks or days, or hopefully not months, so you end up with some huge sheet like this. This is just a, like an animation which just has like columns of information and then the HS code as the target output. So hopefully you end up with something like this, you collect this, and hopefully it's good enough quality for you to use. So once you have this sort of data set, what do you do, right? Now we model. So this was the picture from earlier. This is just a nice way of like thinking about processes. So the idea is that you want to solve problems by pattern matching, or it's more like problem solving by pattern matching. So over time, you build up an experience there's going to be talks about intuition later, but you build up an experience of what sort of works or what sort of doesn't work in different paradigms. And then once you have something like this, you have your own version of this type of chart. You start thinking, is it a clustering problem? Is it a regression problem? Is it something for me to do an unsupervised extraction on top of? Or things like even like a classification problem. You probably have different versions of this in your mental model. And then you start separating it out. You start separating out the versions which are completely incompatible with your idea. And then you start thinking about ones in which you will actually spend effort on. And that effort is something I like to call gradient descent, but just that this is not the gradient descent which your computer is probably calculating. This is probably your own mental model of gradient descent where you have your own hyperparameters that you want to tune and get the right results. So instead of thinking, it, thinking of it like a hill climbing problem, <laughs> it's like yourself. You want to like consider multiple options. You probably want to tweak your parameters. And then this sort of human powered gradient descent is what we also end up doing when we select different models or we select different parameters and settings within each model. Again, these are things which come with experience. They're probably much more qualified people who might be talking about like much more experience in the nitty gritty of the models and the details. But for me, the idea was you get something done over here, you get a model out, but then you want to subsequently improve on the model. You want to subsequently see what are the impacts, what are the outputs. Like the classification model works, but how do you start measuring around it? So we arrived after like multiple trials. So if you can think of the SK learn prediction classifiers, you can think of deep learning models, you can think of fast text, which is really popular these days. So we tried like a whole bunch of different models and then we end up choosing one. And then the next step is to go for some sort of validation. So you start thinking like, how do I go about testing my model? How do I go about like verifying whether it's actually good enough? So at the end of the day, this is going to be the bottom line. Like, if you go out and tell your client or tell your CEO that I have everything, it works great, they're not going to be interested on in whether you used a million nodes or like 100 billion nodes. They're going to be interested on what is the bottom line accuracy. And then they're going to give you some example like this. They're going to bring back the same product. And then they're going to ask you, like, what do you want? What is the output answer? So the bottom line was that at this point, we were at like 40%. So at that point, you just like give up, you lie back, and then you think, where have I gone wrong? <laughs> So at this point, the idea is that these numbers are not 100% realistic of our efforts at that time, but the scales or orders of magnitude should be roughly the same. So again, at this point, you start reconsidering your life choices. You're like, should I have done economics in school or something like that? And then you go back to the drawing board, hopefully not all the way to your childhood, but to the time you started the model. And then you go back and then you start reconsidering. So one of the assumptions that you make early on is that the data that you collected has the necessary information. So I like to call that input has that right. So that's like the first question that you might want to ask. So again, feature engineering is something which people really like or spend a lot of time on. It's probably like a huge place where you can get lost, like trying to tweak, trying to attribute importance to different features and everything. But the idea is that for our use case for here, if there's name, description, material usage for the product, you want to make sure that the assumptions or the underlying factors which you consider hold still correctly, are still correct. And for that, there are three aspects which I usually like. One is availability. So given a shipping record, is the information, is, is the feature really available? So what do you do if the feature is not available? Some guy might just choose not to say what the product is going to be used for or what the product is made of. So just the complete lack of the product information might be a factor. There's also the accuracy. If it's made of wool, but someone says it's made of cotton, then it's like completely wrong again. Those are again factors which you would consider when either buying your data set or, or training your data set or building your data set and then later when you're evaluating the accuracy numbers as well. 
And finally, there's also one more part, which is specificity. Because this is something which you might ignore initially also, because when we build our idealized versions of training systems, we sometimes give a lot more detail than what we might expect of in the real world. That's because we should really be prepared for more mere output data or input data. And that's what I like to call as lesser data to an extent. So specificity is a problem where, for example, it might say it's made of 50% polyester. Maybe that's the right answer. But as someone just says polyester. Whereas the governments are so strict in their regulation that a 1% difference probably makes like a double the cost of the tax. So again, if it was roughly just a single line entry which just said the item name and the price, that is some data which you probably have to solve using other means. You probably have to go back and then look up the product information using some other source. And those are what people are doing when they do manual tasks. So they get a product, but they try to Google it. They try to find the relevant information. Take that into the system before feeding it to the model. So things like that often become essential before you like start just optimizing on one specific aspect of your system. So the other aspect over here, one was assuming the data was there. The other was using the structure of the output itself that you expect. So one of the things that I glossed over initially was that the output label, which is like a full level code over here, is not really like one, one to n sort of system. So if you consider like random monkeys on typewriters, you have like a 6,000 output class system, and then you have a randomized output which falls like far below 1%. The idea is that you don't want to jump into making a, such a discrete small decision. So one of the things which was there was that there's also structure in the data. This is of course something which might seem obvious in hindsight, but this is of course, end of the day, people usually only report the first number, but they're really interested on the impact as it scales down. So if you're able to isolate like the three levels of categorization, which certainly helps, and then you see that as an inherent nested tree type of structure. So as you make subsequent decisions, the search space for your own output uh, output range, yeah, your, your output range is like far lower. So you end up making these sort of decisions where the relative impact of being wrong becomes less worse as you go deeper into your decision tree. And probably at the end of the day, some countries probably have the same tax bracket once you're at two levels or once you're at four levels. That'll probably not affect the bottom line for the company. And of course, predictions imitate data. So what you feed into the system is what is going to come out. If you end up having outliers in your, in your own input data and your model is very sensitive to those sort of outliers, you end up tweaking your own answers to like much worse results. So one of the things, just for context, is that the code for regulation, which is sort of the, this is the US one, I think, it, it recommends a standard of reasonable care. So they say that importers must consider reasonable care or must exercise reasonable care. This is like legally, so I have no idea what that means. But then when we look at the data, what that translates to is that one in three products were misclassified even in our own training data set. And this is something which was a shock to us because this is something which has cleared customs. This is not something which we built manually. This is something which everyone in the country said, I mean, the, the officer probably said, okay, I'll take the product, this seems right to me. And then we see the same product go again and then it gets a different code, and then a different person who probably came to work late that night or hadn't had coffee, and then he was like, okay, I'll still take the code, even though it's different from what was previously approved. And these sort of training data sets are what you build upon. If your data is going to be like this, your predictions need to account for it. Now the other question is, what if repeatability is not guaranteed? So when the same product clears with like different codes, what do you end up doing? So given that the classification is built into your own system, right? It's built into the process that you're looking to replace. So what do you do? Do you like approach like a consensus problem? Do you want to send it to two different people, see if they agree? If they don't, send it to a third person. So these sort of consensus or proportional labeling will end up influencing how you consider your data as well. So again, we went back, we tried to tweak all of these things. We tried to like make all the changes necessary. And then the boss comes in, he asks the same question again. He asks like a thousand more usually. But then the bottom line accuracy, just for like scaling purposes, was much higher, was closer to like 80%. And then at this point, you're going like, eh, what's the point? I get like 97% on like <laughs> ImageNet or something. But the idea is that it's not about the accuracy numbers, it's also what about the processes that you're looking to build and the process that you're looking to replace. So think harder, that's step two. It's just a surprise that they lined up with the problem statement and think harder. But yeah, think really hard this time. 
what did it cost? So at the end of the day, you ask Thanos, what did it cost? And then he says, there are compliance issues. He says, if you get it wrong, if you get it wrong, there are going to be like statutory audits. There are mandated requirements that you disclose all the things that went wrong, and then there are requirements which cause a lot more legal trouble for your company. There's also going to be monetary problems. What if you declare a code and then it ends up with a 7% match or a 27% tax rate? And then finally, if someone is not very happy with your system, they might just push the terminal to one side and they might go back to their old place. And then you're back to processing shipments in minutes instead of seconds. So these are cost functions which are not baked into your system, but these are cost functions which you would probably need to consider for your own idea of the business use case that you're looking to solve. And of course, it's uh, all in the data. Like whatever you want is probably in there. So one of the things is that we work with e-commerce companies, so we probably don't care about shipping cows to countries, or we probably don't care about the grain stock which goes from one place to the other. We are probably interested in like smaller sections of the code book. So we try to see, do we have enough samples in those proportional sections? If most of the shipments is going to be electronics and not grain, then does it matter if you get grain wrong? Or do you need to collect more data just for electronics instead of like trying to get shipment records for which most of the data is different? And then of course, this is one thing which we really liked, which is like to train people to train machines. This is a really nice project which I wanted to talk about, but before that, we have Richard Socher. I, he was at Metamine and I think at Salesforce now, but not here, but I think he's at Salesforce. But the idea is that instead of spending months trying to solve a problem, the idea is that you just label some data for a week and hopefully you're able to solve it much better. And this is a tool I really like. There are probably versions of this which you could build yourself, but this is from one of the creators of the NLP package, Spacey. This one is called Prodigy. The idea is that you have these sort of interfaces, whether you're a data scientist, whether you're a QA person, whether you're someone who's just looking at the data to make sure it's all kosher. The idea is that you look at this, the system sort of makes a prediction. It guesses that the Nintendo Switch is what you're interested in. And then as yourself, you just simply annotate yes, no, or you reject it. So there are two aspects which are into this. One is, of course, you help build a higher quality data set with like minimal trouble. You could probably get anyone who's like bored for like a few minutes to just go through this game. And it also helps your system understand which areas it's sort of wrong in. So you can sort of build in a online real-time real learning system which shows the next example based on the ones which were built wrong. So this sort of human in the loop systems which are becoming really popular these days are some things which you could really consider to, to improve the performance of your model in, irrespective of just like measuring bottom line buying data sets. The other thing is it's really important to not be afraid to peek under the hood of your whole process. So let's say this is like a typical workflow. It goes from a seller, it goes to a warehouse. That's your classifier processing workflow systems. You have a QA team which inspects maybe one in 100 packages or however you want it. And then it goes to customs and then it finally goes to the buyer. The idea is that you usually monitor the QA team and whatever they say, that's your effect. But the idea is that you start making it into all the other parts of your system. You try to ask the seller themselves to validate the output of your system. Or you ask the customs official if you get it wrong, you get the feedback back into your classifier. So the idea is that you need to, this is probably harder in companies which are distributed across multiple continents where this probably happens in different parts of different countries. So the idea is that these are things which need to be considered instead of like raw accuracy numbers for the beginning and the end. You could probably get a lot more valuable feedback as the domain experts are probably situated in a different team than the team that you finally talk to. So in the long run, so what happens in the long run? These are, this is probably my last slide also. The idea is to consider the aspects of how your system is going to evolve. So there's going to be skew over time. Countries are going to change their own version of how they classify products. There are going to be tariff wars announced over Twitter. Suddenly there's going to be $120 billion on the line. And then if you go look up the actual press release for one of these tweets, it's going to be a list of codes which literally says how much percentage each code is going to be affected. And then you have businesses which specifically avoid those codes and they're selling the same shoe, but they call it something else. They call it like a sports accessory instead of like a apparel, piece of apparel. So those type of hacks happen where people start classifying their codes in different aspects just to make workarounds. So these are things which cause evolution in the same data looking different. And of course, there are newer product categories. Say someone brings out the 
iPad or what do you have? Say a VR headset. Say a VR headset comes out soon, right? How do you classify these? Do they go into entertainment? Do they go into computation? Or do they go into eyewear? So there's this interesting talk by Titus Winters. He calls it, he wants to talk about the difference between programming and software engineering. So he talks about programming as getting it to work the first time, where you mash out your hello world or you try to pin the Fibonacci sequence and it works. Software engineering is that integrated over time. So he thinks about software engineering as the process that need to evolve around the system so that your programming stays relevant. For me, this was interesting because I'm not sure what the parallel is. So if you think about programming is to software engineering, and then you look at the equivalent, how do you go from data science to what would be that? I think that's also the idea here where you want to talk to people who are probably implementing systems, and then hopefully we have a lot more fruitful discussions over the next few days. So that was my talk. You can get the slides this, at this link. That was a study in classification. I'm Ramran Balakrishnan. Thank you very much. Oh, we have about five minutes for questions. Any questions from the audience? Hey, hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry. Uh, so my question was more around, uh, you talked about uh, how do we really generate our data for, for the training purpose because that's a very important factor when it comes to, you know, if you really can't do anything with the algorithm, then something is wrong with the data. But there are a lot of cases where that uh, turns out to be a one-time effort, right? Uh -huh. And you would ideally want that the process that you follow for whatever, uh, you know, model you're creating is scalable to incoming data over time. So is there some sort of a strategy that you guys follow to make sure that manual effort can be structured in a certain way or, you know, uh, done in a certain way, which can be, you know, scalable over time as new data, fresh data keeps coming in? So one of the major issues is uh, having consistency in the data set. So there are, there are multiple practices around this where, so there's also cause and effect, right? <clears throat> so when you said that when your system is now online and there's new data coming in, how do you end up like conflating that data with what you already have? And some practices in the past involve like, even though you have your whole system replacing a process, you try to keep that process still alive, but at like a much smaller factor. So when someone sends 10 products, probably nine of those still go to the original system, but you try to keep a version of it separate, or you do all of them and then you still do one more. And then those sort of help you predict where the deviations sort of occur. This is much more common in like uh, ranking systems where you show five products in order and then just the fact that you showed it first influences your output. So to have like a clearly separated data, it's not a solved problem, but there are approaches to it. Sure, hi Ramnan, this is Nikesh. Thank you for the talk. Um, one, two questions. One is just curious about what was the accuracy of the humans? Like I said, so if one in three products were misclassified, <laughs> So okay. if you're training against that, yeah. you're probably looking at like 70% baseline on repeatability. So you can't do a human accuracy. What we do is we ask multiple people to classify it, and then we consider them as multiple inputs, and then we see what is their internal consistency. It comes to about 70% roughly, yeah. Okay, and in these kind of scenarios where spe especially you could have huge costs in compliance and all those kind of uh -huh. things, does it make, make sense to have a um, machine-assisted system for humans where maybe the machine could figure out the first three levels, right? And then maybe the finer bit uh, can still save time for so, humans, yeah. right? Uh, so the question is, it's augmented uh, yes, learning. Yes, yes. That's, the, that's, that's exactly how we have it rolled out for many customers as well. The idea is not to like remove people from the equation. The idea is to simplify a task which probably took hours into like minutes. And that's also more effective for us to make a sale. We don't want to tell people that we'll protect you. We don't want to take liability or risk. We probably help them with like making a faster decision and it hopefully at the cost of like having better accuracy as well. So 
a lot of the modern systems where it's possible to do have humans in the loop, it's not a real-time ad-serving technology. It's a processing line. So in those places, we do recommend people still monitor the results. Thank you.